It's the ACDC Beyond the Thunder Podcast. With your host, Kurt Squire. It's time to rock. Welcome everyone to ACDC Beyond the Thunder, a podcast where we talk with extraordinary fans who've been influenced by this extraordinary band. I'm your host, Kurt Squires, and today we have a very special guest who has one of the most incredible connections to ACDC that you will ever hear, we promise you. It'll send chills down your spine. It is truly an honor to be sitting here in Huntsville, Alabama, next to this Black Hawk pilot, author of In the Company of Heroes, and military war hero himself, Michael Durant. Best known for being the sole survivor during the Battle of Mogadishu in Somalia, a story made famous in the film Black Hawk Down, where he was held captive for 11 days. Mike, thanks so much for having us here in your home. We've got a lot to talk about, so let's just jump right in. Um, being a fellow New Englander, we briefly discussed you being raised in New Hampshire. Um, when was the first time it hit you that you said, I want to serve my country? Well, my father was a uh, full-time National Guardsman, so he would he wore a uniform every day. And that, to me, that was just normal. I mean, that's, you know, that, that was the standard day for us in our household. What really inspired me to join the military was get in, uh, having an opportunity to go fly in a helicopter with a friend of the family. I mean, that was it. You know, anybody that's ever flown a helicopter will tell you they remember their first experience. It's just, it's unique. It's not like an airplane. To be able to hover, it was over Mount Washington, which is the highest point in the Northeast, you know, 6,280 feet. And we're just hovering over the top, looking down at these hikers and, and people down on the ground. And I'm thinking, if this is this guy's job, that's what I want to do. You know, this is this has got to be the best uh, way in the world to make a living. I worked with him a little bit and uh, eventually realized the quickest path to the cockpit for me, you know, small town kid from uh, New Hampshire, is probably going to be uh, joining the military to, to fly. But you're talking about a joyride compared to joining the military, which has got to be uh, a culture shock. <laughs> to your system, right? I think, uh, you know, the first time you go into the military for almost everybody, it's a shock. Uh, you know, y your daily life is uh, 180 degrees different from what it was before. You know, they shave your head, all your stuff is gone, you're wearing a uniform, you have no personal items. I mean, I remember I was living in, a, in basic training. Now this is the big, you know, obviously the big transition. I'm in, a, in an open bay barracks with 20 other guys. You know, I mean, that's just, it, it's, hard, it's hard to take that leap from high school student to, uh, you know, listening to rock and roll and doing all the other things high school students do to uh, all of a sudden being, uh, you know, thrust in the military, in the middle of this military environment. And I, I hated it. I mean, I want it out. <laughs> I want it out. And, uh, you know, I, I had some one-on-one -on -one talks with the, with the drill sergeant, and my dad actually got involved. I found out later. They talked to him and said, you know, you can get out of this at this point, but, you know, everybody goes through this, and let's figure out a way to get them to stay the course. And, uh, and I did, and it worked out well. I can imagine being from northern New England, which is predominantly white, to show up and have all of these different cultures and races and creeds and religions into one melting pot and um, musical tastes and what have you. How did you handle that? I mean, yeah, you know, again, that's another thing about the military is, is it, it's, a, it's a diverse set of people. You come from everywhere. So uh, you've got, you know, diff cultural differences, race differences. So again, being from northern New Hampshire, there's not a lot of that up there. Pretty much everybody likes the same one or two hockey teams. Everybody likes the same kind of music. Everybody does the same thing in the winter. And all of a sudden now you're in the middle of this uh, uh, cultural mix, I guess. And uh, it, it was it was all over the map. I mean, you got country western people. You got you know all styles of music uh, would have been entered into my life at that point. And as we know, music is that thing that gets us through the good times and the bad times, and it's that universal language that connects us all. Um, how important was music for you during your initial training? And I, I can just see you now, you're probably the classic rock guy, just blaring your speakers. Absolutely. I mean, you play it as loud as you could get away with. And, uh, you know, I remember w when I was in Korea, my 
uh, my first assignment after flight school. What did I buy? Bose 901s just so I could really rock the house. You know, that's that's took up about three quarters of my first paycheck to pay for that stereo. But, uh, you know, the whole purpose of it was to uh, make sure you took advantage of what that music had to offer. And a lot of the music you were blaring onto your fellow soldiers was none other than ACDC back in the early 80s. Why? Why ACDC? What was so special about them? You know, I don't know. I just, it's just great music. I just, I really enjoy it. It's, uh, I, there's, I don't know they have ever done a bad song. I, I mean, every one of their albums and every one of their songs just, uh, it's a joy to listen to. I, I really, uh, I really like it a lot. It pumps you up. There really does seem to be a natural correlation with ACDC and the military. Uh, songs like, you know, For Those About to Rock, We Salute You, Guns for Hire, Shoot to Thrill, War Machine, This Means War, Dogs of War. Um, not to mention Brian Johnson's father was in the military. Uh, Angus Young is a huge military buff. Was it your experience that ACDC felt like a natural soundtrack in the surrounding? You know, uh, the majority of our crew chiefs who, who own the helicopters, I mean, they don't really own it, but it's their helicopter, uh, would name their helicopter either after a band or after a song. I mean, we had Thunderstruck, we had nice. Heavy Metal, we had... and uh, That's awesome. And that's just the kind of music they liked. You know, they were hardworking, hard partying, great Americans, and, and that's the kind of music that they liked, and that's what motivated them. There was an incident in 1989 where our troops were in panama yeah i was there you were there i was in panama the guy who flew him out of there cliff walcott was killed in somalia and the aircraft he was flying in somalia was thunderstruck that's really why i wrote the night stalkers because the organization that that i was in was a kind of small band of of people who had been involved in a lot of very high profile things over the years and we were all involved in that hunt for, for Noriega. That's amazing you were there. So as you remember, Noriega was facing U.S. indictment for drug trafficking, as well as claims he had rigged the 1989 election. So the embassy was surrounded by U.S. troops, and he refused to give himself up. So the army decided, the U.S. Army decided to use psychological warfare by blasting hard rock music 24-7, bands like you know, Twisted Sister, Van Halen, The Clash, ACDC. Um, had you ever seen psychological warfare like that before? I mean, w what is your take on that? Well, there's, I mean, there's a belief that that kind of music will either aggravate people or, you know, I don't really know what I, I'm. Not, I'm not the right guy to ask what is the strategy behind it, but it's it's done quite often. It's you know, and it's it's part of the whole psychological operation, psychological warfare, to utilize. Uh, you know, I mean, they were the North Vietnamese were doing it in Vietnam. They were broadcasting to the South, not ACDC. But you know, the, their whole idea is you you got a couple of objectives: either to get people to think like you think, or to just annoy them or you know anything you listen to over and over and over and over at a very high level i mean unless you're just totally uh, you know into it is is at some point probably going to become aggravating if you're trying to get some sleep or trying to think or do something you know that maybe is a a boring task so so you graduate from military flight school here in Alabama for our listeners and I don't know if this is uncomfortable for you or not. Just talk a little bit about your accolades and your your resume, military resume, if you will, for people to get a better understanding of all the accomplishments that you've had. You know, well, from a military perspective, I guess you know the, the if you want to call them high points was, was the combat operations. It was uh, during a five year period there. I was in in four different combat situations from. The Persian Gulf in 88 to Just Cause Panama in 1989, Desert Storm in 1991, and then Somalia in 1993. So we had a busy run there. And uh, I was in what I consider to be the most high-speed uh, helicopter aviation unit in the world, was then, still is today, uh, at what we call the point of the spear. It was great stuff. And uh, 
you know, great people. We call them the customers, the guy that we, we the guys that we work with that are on the ground or in our aircraft, the best in the world, uh, you know, just everything you could wish for. You know, when at first flight in a helicopter when I was 14, if I could have even imagined that it would be like that, I don't think I would have believed it. Just the things that we were doing, the units we were operating with. So, you know, in terms of my life experience, I still think that was the high point. Just being in that unit and doing those missions and working with those people. Uh, we worked hard and we played hard. There's no doubt about it. A lot of travel, you know, a lot of time on the road. And anybody that ever does that with a bunch of, you know, hardworking type A's probably knows what I'm talking about. I mean, you just have a good time. You got to you got to burn off some steam, and that's what we did. So you participated in combat operations, Prime Chance, Just Cause, Operation Desert Storm. And were you the first pilot to intercept a Scud missile? Yeah, well, I was the first one to shoot at one okay. in Desert Storm. We were, you know, it was a big political item in the war. Uh, Saddam was trying to draw the Israelis in by launching Scud missiles into Israel. And our mission was to try to stop that, to find them in the act. And uh, in the middle of the night, we found one. And I, I had the opportunity to place the first rounds on it. And you know, I always compare it to, I uh, did some deer hunting when I was a kid. It's like, you know, this is the 14 point largest <laughs> buck that's ever been in New England roaming around right in front of you. Yeah. And it was just an amazing feeling. Which brings us to the fateful date of October 3rd, 1993, Somalia. Mike, in your words, and please take as much time as you need, can you describe to our listeners exactly what went down in Mogadishu? We're over there. Uh, Task Force Ranger, the, the the organization that I'm part of, deploys to try to capture this uh, clan leader named Muhammad Faradid. That's our main mission. Is and and this is all in support of an overarching operation that's really humanitarian. Right. Right. I mean, we were there to begin with to help the Somalis, to help feed them and end the starvation sure, that was going on. Sure. There. But this guy Muhammad Faradid was threatening the relief organizations. He was preventing them from getting their work done. He was stealing the food. I mean, about as bad as it gets. And our mission was to go in there and capture him along with 49 others. There were 50 people on the list that the United Nations wanted uh, brought in for trial. So we deployed after a lengthy train up. Uh, We were about as ready as we could be. And we did six missions uh, leading up to the famous one on October 3rd. All of those went about as well as they could. We didn't lose any aircraft, didn't lose any people. I think at that point we had captured 24 individuals, including the number two guy, a guy named Osman Otto, and turned them all over to the UN. And October 3rd rolls around. <clears throat> now we know a few differences here. It's daytime, we can't use all our technology, our night vision equipment. A bad part of town, it's the Black Sea area. Uh, that's where all the weapons are, that's where all the deed supporters are. Can't land the helicopters because the streets are too narrow. So we're going to have to get everybody that we put in out by ground. So we, that, that kind of adds complexity to the mission and puts those ground vehicles at risk. And then <clears throat> we've done it six times. So it's kind of like running the ball. I always say it's like running the ball up the middle six times. You know, the seventh time if you run the ball up the middle, you're probably not going to get any yards. And you've got to you've got to have that element of surprise. Sure. It's true in sure. sports, it's true in yep. warfare, it's true in business. If everybody knows what you're going to do, it's very hard to win. So we had mixed it up as much as we could, but this is the seventh mission, and they understand a little bit about how we're doing this, and they were ready. I mean, they had their RPGs, their rock propel grenades out. They uh, came at us en masse. So the estimates are they fired 125 RPGs at us during that mission. That, I mean, that's a lot for... For an organization like that that doesn't have you know a lot of money, money a lot of funding, they really kind of went all in on that one to 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 shoot all those RPGs. But the results were five Blackhawks shot down. Most people aren't aware of that, but we lost five Blackhawks in that mission. And uh, everybody focuses on the two, the first one that went down, and then mine because we went down in the city. The other three made it back. So uh, I get shot down, and unfortunately, the whole mission's unraveled at this point. The commander doesn't have enough resources to really fight one battle, and he's in the middle of three. So we're, it's not openly stated, but we're kind of 
put to the third priority. And the reason is there's only five of us, or there's only four of us at the, at the crash site, whereas at these other locations, a lot more people. It's like triage, you know, you gotta treat the, who you can help the most first. So we're kinda on our own. And then these two uh, Delta commandos, Randy Shugart and Gary Gordon, the only ones left on an aircraft other than air crew at this point, volunteer to get put on the ground. And uh, they make their way to the crash site. They get me out of the cockpit, help everybody else in the crew. We're all alive at this point. And then we basically are forced to fight it out on our own. There's now six of us. And unfortunately, we're isolated from the main body. And in about 20 minutes time, the enemy overruns us. And when they do that, they kill everybody. And they don't, they didn't kill me. The only theory I have is they didn't know I was there initially because they attacked from the opposite side of the aircraft. And when they did see that I was there and I was still alive, they initially looked like they were going to kill me. But somebody realized that I had value as a live prisoner. And uh, as the story goes, fired shots into the air, got control of the mob because it was not a, it's not a true military force. It's a mix of civilians and clans people and who knows who, all just out of control. And uh, managed to get those people away get me into custody, if you will, and then get me out of there. In the process, I ended up getting my cheekbone broken, my nose broken, my eye socket. They ripped all my gear off. They threw dirt in my mouth and in my, in my uh, eyes, wrapped a rag around my head and, and hoisted me up in the air and were carrying me around through the streets like a trophy. I mean, it was the most insane. I mean, we call it the mosh pit from hell in the, in the book. And really, that's about the most appropriate way to describe it. Just imagine being held up by you know, hundreds of people who want to rip you apart and, and being badly injured to begin with with a broken back and a broken femur. It was a horrific experience. Absolutely terrifying, Mike. We had seen a documentary uh, where after the crash, you eventually came to, and the first thing you did was take off your watch and your wedding ring? At the, right after we hit the ground, I don't know why I did it. I, I you know, when you when you regain consciousness, if you've ever been knocked out, things don't make a lot of sense, and you and you don't really do things that, when you look back later, you you truly understand. And I took my watch band off, I took my wedding ring off, set them on the console, took my helmet off, and I just reached out, picked up my MP5 nine uh, millimeter, and realized that if I was going to live, I was going to have to fight it out from right there. You know what was scary for me reading about this, Mike, was the fact that these were women and children with weapons, not just male soldiers, correct? Yeah, no rules, and anything goes. I mean, I'm sure you saw the footage in the aftermath. They, they did things that I, quite frankly, didn't think humans were capable of. I mean, you see it in movies, but I don't think you ever really think that stuff happens, at least not today in this world that we live in. But it, it did. It was the most horrific thing uh, I can imagine. So up to this point, your friends don't even know if you're dead, alive, hurt, or how badly hurt. They don't even know where you are. Tell us a little bit about this imprisonment, this horrific experience, and how the hell does ACDC fall into this story? Yeah, the experience was all over the map. I mean, it started out terrifying. I mean, am I going to live through the next five seconds? I mean, it was truly moment to moment just to try to get through this chaos. And then once I got away from the mob and, and got and isolated, they kept me in three different places over that 11 days, things calmed down a little bit. And I had time to think. I had time to you know, get the dirt out of my face and figure out what was wrong with me physically and try to collect my thoughts. And they were interrogating me early on. They were, you know, they're after the, the, the statements that are going to undermine the operation. They want you to say, we shouldn't be here. They want you to say, you know, this is wrong. And I, I had been to survival school and, and I did a pretty decent job of uh, uh, falling or uh, preventing myself from falling into that trap. They, uh, they video interrogated me on day two. And that, that videotape ended up airing, I'm told, in 127 countries within 10 minutes of being shot. It was actually a subcontractor for CNN who shot the footage and got it out somehow via satellite, and it was broadcast in about 10 minutes. 
Right. I remember that vividly. Right after that, that was taken uh, at night on the 4th. Right after that, I made my first move. The, uh, the move was, again, a horrible experience because they hadn't really done anything to treat any of my injuries at this point. So, you know, they're just throwing me around like a sack of potatoes. And that, that femur fracture was a compound femur fracture at this point. So the bone's gone out through the skin. Oh, I mean, it was just that's awful. How I didn't end up losing my leg, I don't, I don't understand. But that's uh, so awful. They got me to the next place. Things settled down a bit. And that's really where a lot of the interesting uh, incidents occur. Uh, I'm, I'm, we call it the Hotel Nowhere. It looked like an old, uh, an old hotel, maybe in a Stephen King story, you know, something that's been abandoned, you know, strip motel with, uh, you know, the, the doors that lead to the rooms out on a balcony. And uh, they take me down the balcony and bring me into this one room at the end. And that's where I ended up getting visited by uh, some journalists. And then I got visited by the Red Cross. And the Red Cross uh, sent back a box of items, one of which uh, was a Bible that I, I decided to, to read and turn into a journal. And then the Somalis along the way asked me if I wanted a radio. And we were taught in survival school that you don't do things that maybe go over the line to better your situation. So if they said, you know, do you want a radio? Uh, as long as you make a statement for us, we'll give you a radio. That would be wrong. But they just gave me the radio. They said, do you want a radio? And I said, well, sure. You know? So I had this little transistor radio and I, I kept it. I didn't, there were no Bose 901s here. I had, I had this thing turned all the way down for two reasons. One, I didn't know if I'd get another set of batteries anytime soon. And number two, I didn't want anybody out in the street hearing me listening to uh, Armed Forces Network or whatever else happened to be on, on the radio at the time. So I kept it turned kind of low. Well, when the Red Cross visited, she saw that I had this radio. So when she got back, she talked to the guys back in the unit about what she saw. You know, they, they got very strict rules about telling people where I am because of their neutrality, but she could say some things. And she mentioned that I had a radio. So that set off this whole series of requests that now start getting broadcast over Armed Forces Network. So I don't know where they got this list of favorite songs, but they, they had songs from, uh, you know, Oops, There It Is to Whiskey River to uh, Back in Black. I mean, it was nice. all it was all over the, the entire spectrum. But, you know, the, what that meant to me to hear those, hey, Mike, this is for you from Cliff or hey, Mike, this is for you from Bull or whatever. I mean, you can't imagine, you know, how uplifting that is to hear that, uh, you know, coming through that radio knowing that the, those are your friends out there that are probably going to do whatever they can to come and, and save your butt. What a morale booster that must have been for you. So I end up then uh, spending a couple of days there. And about day four, <clears throat> I hear this helicopter. And it wasn't uncommon. I mean, there were helicopters flying around in the city all the time. But when you're in captivity, if you hear an aircraft, it obviously gets your attention because the first thing you're trying to determine is, do they know where I am? I mean, or can I somehow signal to them so that they can figure out where I am so that they can launch a rescue attempt? So I'm trying to figure out where this helicopter is because, you know, sometimes it's difficult to, to tell where an aircraft is or what direction it is. And you can hear the rotor system and the rotor blades, and then I hear this bong, bong. Wow. And I'm like, what is that? And, you know, again, because with the wind, it's kind of going in and coming in and fading out. And then I hear the, the beginning of, of Hell's Bells start up. Wow. And it was just, it was an incredible moment. I mean, it was, they, were, they had these loudspeakers attached on the side of this Blackhawk. And they were flying around the city broadcasting this music. And the hope was that I would hear it. And you definitely heard it, right? I definitely heard it. And then when, when the song was over, and of course it got the Somalis all agitated because they're, they're wondering, what is this all about? I mean, they're confused. They don't, they don't realize, you know, they can't understand why would the Americans be doing this? They're kind of pointing at the sky and they're looking at me like that I'm supposed to explain to them what this is all about. And I'm like, you know, I don't know, you know, I guess they're having a party, you know, <laughs> I don't know what's happening. And uh, <clears throat> immediately following the song, I hear this voice saying, Mike, we won't leave here without you. And it's the voice of one of my closest friends, Dan. And there's not a lot of things that 
still send a chill up my spine, but... Mike, I'm pretty sure that sends chills up just about everybody's spine. To think about that moment when I, when I heard that music and I heard that call from Dan from the sky saying they wouldn't leave without me, it just, it, it, it's just, it's something I'll never, ever forget. The, the impact of knowing those guys are doing everything they can do to figure out where I am and when they do, they're coming through the door. There's no doubt in my mind. It's a huge, just a, an uplifting feeling to, to know that. I mean, you know it anyway, but to actually hear it made a huge difference. So at this point, you're still in captivity. They don't know where you are, but they're blaring hell's bells in the skies above. You must have been thinking, okay, they know I have an affinity for ACDC, but why hell's bells, right? Well, and that's the thing, because... It, Communication is, is what you crave. You, you, you want communication with the outside world. So you're, you're trying to figure out, is there a message here? Is there something they're trying to make me understand? Or am I just stupid and am I not getting it or what? And, and they're doing it too because I wrote a letter while I was in captivity and I said some things that were some just arbitrary, which I probably shouldn't have done now looking back, but uh, I said something about you know, I can't wait to get out of here and have a big plate of spaghetti because that's my favorite food. Well, there was a spaghetti factory in the city. So they thought, he mentioned spaghetti, he must be near the spaghetti factory. Oh, so they're all, you know, focusing their, oh. their searches over by that part of town. I don't know where I was. That was the, the big challenge about the whole thing. I had no idea where I was at any point in time. Still don't today. Don't have any idea where I was in the city. Um, so... You are. You're, you're, on both sides, you're going through that struggle. What are they trying to say to me? What can I get out to them so that they can figure out where I am and get, get people in here to get me out? And I think, given enough time, we'd have, we'd have made that connection. There's, there's no doubt about it. But we didn't make it before I left. It just wasn't enough time. So the fact that they chose Hell's Bells had nothing to do with the actual lyrics or the, the tolling of the bell. There was no deep message there. Uh, yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I should go find out why they picked it. I, I mean, my theory all along was it's, it's one of my favorite albums, so they just they picked that and they knew it was, and, th and that's what they decided to play. But uh, it certainly was, and uh, it still is today. What do the lyrics of that song mean to you now? Have you ever sat down and, and taken a closer look at those? Uh, I yeah, I have a little bit, and. Uh, it's appropriate. I mean, I don't know whether they really put the thought into it. You know, do these are these the lyrics we want to we want to select here? I'm not sure they took it that far. Dan, I should ask him. I mean, he was he was instrumental in, in orchestrating that whole process. Uh, he may know, but uh, they were certainly appropriate. One of the very reasons why we produce this podcast, ACDC Beyond the Thunder, is to showcase just how influential. This band has been from actors to authors to athletes to uh, politicians to professors and military war heroes. It, it's just insane to us how influential this one band has been uh, on a global level. Well, I, I, you know, what's interesting is that the, the cross-generational impact that the band has had, you know, it's just to this day... I don't recall a major sporting event that I've been to or watched where some song, you know, usually Hell's Bells or some other ACDC song, Thunderstruck or Those About to Rock. I mean, it's in there almost every time. I just went to a hockey game in, in Tampa three weeks ago, and I think they played three songs during the game. And, and you know, to see uh, some of my kids enjoying the same music is it's just... Uh, it's great because I can. It helps me relate to them. I, I can understand why they like it. It's great stuff. If you think about it, Hell's Bells does have this ominous tone, especially in the intro, where you can see how it lends itself to the mood and the soundtrack of so many different situations. We recently spoke with Trevor Hoffman, Major League Hall of Fame pitcher, um, who closes one of the best closers of all time in the game who comes out to Hell's Bells uh, as he walks to the mound and the crowd goes nuts. It's like the, 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 an incredible anthem for him and, and the meaning it has for him and the meaning it has for you. 
Um, it's just uh, one of those songs that has taken on a life of its own. To this day, if I get in my car and I turn on Hell's Bells, I mean, I still get that chill going down my spine. I mean, is whoever selected the beginning of that song is just a, a genius. I mean, it's an anthem. That it's it has such an emotional impact for me, and I know a lot of other people. That's why it's so popular. So you go on to tell this incredible experience in your book, In the Company of Heroes, and now you're an author. But not before the film Black Hawk Down comes out in 2001, were you even aware of the film? Were you included in the film? Uh, did you muster up the courage to even go see it? I know for a while you were, you know, there were months where you were just emotionally a wreck. Well, I put it off. I put, I put the first one off and uh, for a couple of reasons. The, the community that I was in in the military is somewhat secretive. People don't talk about it. And uh, when you do, you usually chastise. I mean, you usually kind of, you're an outcast and no longer uh, invited into the, into the inner circle. So I, I didn't want to, I, I love those guys. I love the unit. Never wanted to break that bond. And then Black Hawk Down comes out and it basically opens it up. I mean, the whole thing is revealed. Things that I thought would never make it out into the public domain are now on the big screen, you know. Uh, and I remember when the movie came out, uh, I didn't go right away. I waited, I wasn't sure, how am I gonna react to seeing a depiction of my friends being killed on screen or myself on screen? So I waited, kinda went, wanna go on my own terms, and, and I went, and interesting that it didn't affect me all that much. And, and my theory is, it didn't look real. I mean, these are not the people that were really there. Whereas something like Save It Private Ryan, I can't, you know, you're going to have to pry the, the arms of the chair out from my hands because it looks real to me. So the experience was not all that traumatic. But at the end of Black Hawk Down, the movie, they don't really even say what happened to me. Exactly. Prior to this interview, I rewatched Black Hawk Down as a refresher because I, had, I hadn't seen it for a little while. And there you are in captivity and the movie ends. And I'm like, oh my God, what happens to Mike? I mean, right. I'm, in, I'm right. in captivity and that's kind of how the movie ends. So I think, okay, opportunity only hits you over the head with a sledgehammer a couple of times in life. And this is a blockbuster movie it's tied to a new york times best-selling book and i'm a main character in it and there's really no ending here and what happens to me i got on the phone called some people said how do i get this book published and uh and that started the journey we got it done in about uh, a year's time which is pretty quick trying to get you know take advantage of of all that notoriety that the black hawk down had and it was very successful new york times bestseller but in the process, uh, we wanted to put the lyrics to Hell's Bells in the book. And we were having a little trouble getting authorization, not just for that, but from a couple of other things. We had some other media that we wanted in there. And it's just, it's not a priority for most people out there to, to say, yeah, you know, you can use my stuff for your book. And it took a lot of time to get all that done. And we're at the 11th hour. And we're to the point, because the publishing company doesn't want to take any legal risk here, we're going to pull some stuff because we don't have authorization. And we don't yet have authorization for Hell's Bells. And I check my email, and I've got this email message from a guy named Brian Johnson. And he says, I'm the lead singer of ACDC. And I'm like, well, I know that if this is really you, you know. And he says, uh, we, we found your letter asking for permission to use the lyrics. And I just want you to know that uh, the boys in the band uh, are you know, big fans of the military and you can do whatever you want with those lyrics. And that's not exactly what he said, but that's basically what he said. I'm in shock. I mean, the scene that came to my mind was the Saturday Night Live, uh, you know, we're not worthy scene, you know I mean? Cause I mean, I grew up worshiping these guys, you know, and I just got an email from Brian Johnson. Like, this is amazing. So I'm, somewhat skeptical that it's real, but I'm wondering, you know, how could it not be real? Who else would know that we're trying to get these lyrics approved? So I emailed him back and said, hey, Brian, can you call my cell phone? I just want to make sure, you know, uh, I'm straight on what your, what, what, what your, your, the terms of, of, of this offer or whatever it was I said. In the meantime, I realized I don't have a CD copy of Back in Black. So I go to the store, I'm buying the CD, my cell phone rings, is Brian. I'm You're like, kidding me. <laughs> back in black, 
Brian, <laughs> you know, and he says, hey, mate, uh, just w got your email. You know, how you doing? I'm a big military buff, drives me wife crazy. You know, he's just, he's just a riot to talk to. And, and uh, he said, yeah, you know, we, we'd love to have you use the lyrics. Uh, wow. God bless Brian Johnson. You know, again, they're big supporters of the military and easygoing guys, and I'm just in shock. So, I, you know, I call the publishing company and said, hey, we're, we're good to go. We're cleared hot, as we say in the military. So they, uh, they left the lyrics in there, and uh, I've kind of stayed in contact with Brian ever since, certainly sent him copies of, uh, of that book, signed. Uh, and uh, then I wrote a second book called The Night Stalkers, more about more stories from that same organization. And and uh, sent them some signed copies of that as well, as well as some of the other folks that are involved in the, with the band. And, you know, it's, uh, it's flattering to me to think that they're even aware of me, never mind reading my books. So it's, a, it's just been a great experience. Well, let's face it, there are heroes, and then there are real-life heroes. So, Michael, we, we, we're just in awe of your heroism and sharing this story with us today. Now, I'm likely to get this wrong, so I'll let you answer it, but you were the first person in media history to be featured on the cover of which magazine simultaneously? It was uh, Time, Newsweek, and U.S. News all in the same week. And I think it actually was the first. The, the, uh, the second was uh, O.J. A few years later. <laughs> oh, come on. Not in the same sentence, Mike. Please, no. How did that make you feel, everyone in the world knowing who you are? You know, it was... It was so overwhelming to go from just a guy to all of a sudden there's all this attention. But I really tried to 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 just take it in stride. You know, this is not going to last. This is a flash in the pan. And uh, I had a great, great quote from a very good friend of mine who's not known for his brilliance, but he said, "You'll you'll know if you make all the right decisions dealing with all this, when the dust settles, you still have the same friends you had before it started. He said, "If you can, if if that's the case, you made all the right calls." And it, and it's been a very simple rule to live by. You know, don't don't let it get to your head because very few people, you know, endure this long term. People like me who are experience, you know, get, have an experience that's a once in a lifetime kind of thing. You can't even begin to allow yourself to believe that this is my new life, I'm famous and people are going to want me forever. It goes away real fast. And if you, if you uh, let the high get too high, the low is going to get pretty low. So I just try to keep it kind of in the middle. And, you know, I, I had to, some neat experiences and, uh, and now I'm back to reality. But we're still talking about it today. And to be honest with you, it, it really sounds like the ACDC mantra. You know, it, it's uh, you're one of us. We're no better than you. Um, we're not going to believe the hype. It's a real blue collar rock and roll band. For them, I'm sure the passion is the music. The passion is not, uh, you know, to be famous and to, to have an entourage and to, to have all the things that a lot of other rock bands might treasure. For them, it's the music. And that's, that's why they're still doing it. And that's why it comes out in the songs that they create. Mike, so it's clear that what ACDC creates um, transcends beyond the music. Um, there's only a handful of bands that can do that. Why do you think ACDC can do that? And what other bands can? I, I don't know. Maybe the Who, you know, you hear a, a lot of Who songs. If you know the music, you, you, can, you can pick it out of a lot of advertising again. And, um but again, I think if you look at the whole spectrum, everything that, that ACDC's music is associated with, I think you'd be challenged to find another band that uh, gets into that many different areas as often as they do. After all these years, are you now known as the Black Hawk Down guy who was rescued after hearing Hell's Bells, even though your character was kind of left in the lurch during the film? And the thing about it is Black Hawk Down is not about me. You know, I mean, I'm a character in it. Black Hawk Down is about the battle. And the battle deserves that story. I mean, it was a huge battle. And, and courageous acts across the board. And, you know, the movie's not about me. doesn't need to be about me. But I did come away with the same thing. I am a fairly major character in there. I'm in it from beginning to end. And, and you know, in some very standalone type situations. And it does end with me in captivity, and you really don't know. And that was the inspiration for me to go, there's more to tell here. Let's go write this book. The movie's got, you know, 
short of two hours to tell this whole story and you know something's going to end up on the cutting room floor and and uh, in the end it probably benefited me that people didn't know the whole story and and wanted to know more and uh, and it really drove the sales of our book up you said that you don't feel like a hero you just got shot down do you still feel that way well you know i mean i did what i had to do you know i didn't uh I didn't do any more than I would do tomorrow faced, faced with the same situation. You know, I, I think all of us uh, did what we were called upon to do. Some did more, and some obviously gave their lives. And for that, you know, we, we were eternally grateful. But uh, for the rest of us, we did what we had been trained to do and did it as best as we could. And that's, so I'm just like all the rest of them. I just ended up with a slightly different set of circumstances I had a second day that nobody else had, and you know I get some extra attention for that. You referenced this motto in your book, which you kindly gave us a copy of and signed these very initials, NSDQ, which stands for Never Surrender, Don't Quit, which quite frankly could very well be ACDC's motto that they've used their entire career. So I think it is a... You know, I, I say I learned three things out of Somalia that I think uh, benefit me every day of my life. Prepare, adapt, and never quit. I mean, that's, that's how you accomplish things. You know, you, you, you make a plan, you get ready, go out there, and as soon as you try to execute it, you got to understand it's not going to go the way you thought it was going to go. So you got to be able to shift left or shift right or do what you need to do to keep moving forward and just keep driving on and you'll be successful. Out of curiosity, did the guys in the band ever send you anything? Once I established contact with Brian, I thought, well, wouldn't the guys back in the unit think it was cool to have autographed pictures from the band to them? And I asked if they'd do that. And, I mean, they sent, like, 20, uh, you know, pictures of the band. Everybody signed it, you know, to the Hooter Brothers, which was our company name within the Night Stalkers. You know, uh, in mem I think I, I asked them to put something like, in memory of Thunderstruck and and all the other great uh, aircraft and Americans, uh, whatever, you know, and, and, and again, no hesitation. You get a big package, uh, you know, FedEx within a couple of days. And just big, big, big supporters and, uh, and uh, great guys. Michael Durant, thank you so much for sharing your incredible story with us today. And thank you for your service. The list of awards that you've accumulated since that time are astonishing. The Distinguished Service Medal, Distinguished Flying Cross, Oak Leaf Cluster, Bronze Star, Valor Device, Purple Heart, uh, Prisoner of War Medals, um, and on and on. You now hold a degree in professional aeronautics, an MBA degree in aviation management, and now the owner, president, and CEO of Pinnacle Solutions right here in Huntsville, Alabama. Michael, it has been a tremendous honor sitting across from you and listening to you tell your story. Thank you again for sharing it with us. And I think I speak for the ACDC fans around the globe when I say we salute you. As always, we end our show with the final question to you, Mike, and that is, if you had to describe ACDC in just one word, what would it be? Awesome. ACDC Beyond the Thunder theme song, Trailer Trash, written and performed by Gannon Arnold. VO Talent by Bruce Jacobson. Cinematography and sound recording by Greg Ferguson. Edited and mixed by Eric Keel. Brand ambassador and marketing guru, Gino Bona. Written, directed, and hosted by Kurt Squires. Produced by Gino Bona, Greg Ferguson, Eric Keel, and Kurt Squires. ACDC Beyond the Thunder is a Squires LLC current motion production. Copyright Beyond the Thunder podcast, all rights reserved. This has been a Nat Attack presentation. Shazbot. Nanu Nanu.